Yeah, I think the uh, big showstopper of LA was the Jeep Wrangler. Um, we all knew it was coming, and yeah, it delivered. Um, it replaces, it's the JL, it replaces the JK model. It's a lighter body on, flame, body on frame platform. Um, and the, I think the most exciting thing about it is the, is the powertrain lineup. Um, we've got a 2.0T doing uh, 270 horsepower, 295 pound feet uh, with an uh, eight speed automatic transmission uh, with mild hybrid. Um, so it does E assist, start stop, um, coasting, Regen. Um, there's also a Pentastar 3.6 liter V6, which is you know, kind of the long running engine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in a, like every FCA product. It's a solid engine. Sure. Um, it, it makes 285 horsepower and 260 pound feet, um, and that is mated to either a six speed manual transmission or an eight speed automatic. Uh, that also has stop start. And then uh, also available is the 3.8. 3.0 liter eco diesel eco diesel man yeah that's going to be available in 2019 uh with 260 horsepower and 442 pound feet of torque and i think that's pretty exciting because i've been waiting for the diesel to come back for quite a while if you've driven you know any of the eco diesels and the ram products in the ram or the uh, the grand cherokee you know it's a, it's a pretty strong engine i'm excited there's something about a diesel in the wrangler and really any jeep that to me, that just makes sense. Maybe it goes back to kind of that, like, that military feel. Sure. Some people are like, you know, for certain vehicles, like, say, an Equinox diesel, it feels a little different. It's weird, you know, to have a diesel in that kind of vehicle. Uh, you got to get past the preconceptions, <laughs> but that's just a different argument. But to me, for the Wrangler, that just fits. Yeah, I mean, it, it can seem a little clunky in some cars, but, yeah, for the, for the Wrangler, I, I mean, I remember growing up, uh, driving CJs that had diesel engines. You know, that was, that was you know, a classic thing. So I'm, I'm glad to see it back. In breaking news, just in, uh, Mike Manley confirmed this. At the Los Angeles Auto Show this week, a plug-in hybrid model, electric, 2020. It's yep. on tap. I'm excited about that. Uh, we were talking about this off-camera. This is, this might be the vehicle, like, I think both of us very strongly consider getting, you know, yeah. in 2020. I would hold out for the, the PHEV. Um, I could feel a little bit better about uh, the environment as I trample it in my off-road vehicle. Right, but, <laughs> right. But um, I think it'd make it, yeah, a lot better even in the city, um, just saving fuel. And, of course, you know, the extra torque from the electric motors off-road would be great. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, it would probably come down to pricing. I think, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a premium for the diesel engine, likely for this. There is for the other FCA mm -hmm. diesels. Um, you know, the Turbo 4 is an intriguing engine, too, with something like 295 pound-feet of torque. That's pretty potent. Uh, not necessarily sure I'd, that's the dynamic I'd want in my Jeep. Yeah. I don't know. Part of me almost thinks, like, all things being equal, if, like, just that Pentastar V6 is, like, essentially, like, the cheapest engine and, like, you know, I might just go that way. Call me a curmudgeon, but that's a really good engine. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't go wrong with that. I mean, it, it really is a solid motor. Yeah. And then, I mean, again, it would come down to pricing. But to your point, that plug-in, like, that changes what the Wrangler could do. Not only does it help off-road, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly it makes it, like, perhaps a viable, like, just SUV that you could drive around suburbia, which if you live in Metro Detroit, you see Wranglers everywhere. It's yeah. like, literally, it's like one out of five cars. People get the employee discount, and people love Wranglers. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're awesome. But uh, right now, they're not great on gas, yeah. and they're not good at all on gas, really. And they're not that comfortable, frankly. And this new one is supposed to be a little bit more comfortable while not compromising those sort of trail capabilities. But then you throw in a plug-in hybrid and like, well, wait a minute here. Now I got something. Yeah. So I think we're really excited about the diesel and the hybrid. I'll be following that closely because I'm curious to see what, you know, the fuel savings will be and, and the benefits on and off-road from the electric motor. So that's, I mean, that's what the Wrangler is. You know, we'll kind of quickly move through here. The significance, I don't think you can say enough. This is the icon for yeah. Jeep. And it's a, it's a tasteful evolution, I'd say. It's not uh, groundbreaking. Um, it's got a nicer interior, but they didn't go too crazy. I don't think the purists are going to be angry. Right. Um, but, yeah, it just gives people a little more content and uh, more comfort. I really like it. I, uh, I saw it in the Design Dome a couple weeks ago. There was a backgrounder for journalists. 
and it just it has this presence. It's a fresher presence. Like the old one does not look that different. It, right. They basically did not change much, but just those like those new headlights. They're piercing. The grill is kind of like a keystone grill, is what they called it. Which essentially, the uh, Mark Allen, he's the head designer, has said they've kind of like sort of massaged the front end, uh, and you can see it. Like side by side, you can see some differences. You know, and really, it's you know, 200 pounds lighter. You know, there's lots, just so many Easter eggs. Like all those mm -hmm. Easter eggs that you would see on like you know the Easter Safari concepts that you had to like essentially buy a special edition Wrangler or Jeep to get. They're just, they're all standard on the new JL, mm -hmm. which I think is sweet. And it's got the folding windshield. Folding windshield. Which is really cool. Six screws or bolts to get it completely off, four to turn it down. It's so much easier. The current one is like something like 28 screws or bolts, excuse me. You turn it down, you have to break paint. It's, it's a pain. <laughs> so, I mean, again, I'm just picturing myself in like 2019 or 2020 rolling around and I'd probably get the four door. I know the two door Rubicons like that, like military icon, but I'd probably get the four door and put my windshield down. I'm just, this is what I'm envisioning. Like yeah. Me in the next couple of years rolling around. Town I could see and, you fording a few rivers mm -hmm. with your dog in the back. Dog and also future product, uh, baby, in, uh, also in 2018. <laughs> Congratulations. So, yeah, thank you. So, well, uh, lots of different things going on in this future Greg and this future Wrangler. Yeah. But we've talked a lot about that. Speaking of family vehicles, the Subaru Ascent. Mm -hmm. Three-row SUV, big deal. It's um, very, you know, it's subtle. It's very Subaru-looking. Doesn't look, you know, at all out of place in the Subaru lineup. It was definitely one of our most um, clicked-on stories. The video has got a lot of views. So if you're watching this, clearly you like the Subaru Ascent. Uh, I, you know, I think it's a critical vehicle for them. We're talking about uh, just some basics here. It's a three-row vehicle. 260 horsepower turbo four-cylinder, and uh, you know it could hold up to eight people. Uh huh. Um, yeah, it, it's an eight-passenger, three-row, but you can do captain's chairs in the second row for uh, no extra cost. Um, the engine is new. It's mm -hmm. a 2.4-liter flat four with a twin twin scroll turbo. Um, it makes 260 horsepower, 277 pound-feet of torque. Um, it's mated to a CVT. Uh, but it has uh, manual mode with paddles. Um, and it's got the uh, X mode off-road button with a uh, hill descent. Um, and it can tow 5,000 pounds. Not bad, Yeah, not bad. I think uh, here's some key, other key specs, 19 cup holders. It's a lot of cup Whoa. holders. <laughs> and eight USB ports, which you need. Yep. And I believe it held 18 golden retrievers for the reveal. Uh, I think it was it was eight. Eight, it I'm was, sorry. Yeah, eight. It was a lot 18 of 18 golden retrievers would be a lot, but eight <laughs> is still a lot I'm of sure dogs. they'd fit. Yeah, they probably would. Yeah. So it's it's definitely Subaru's playing to like, um, you know, the crowd of people that have, you know, maybe you're, you have one kid and the second kid's on the way. Or you have two and you're, just your normal compact mid-size crossover is done. You, the third is on the way, and you got to move up to that third row. And yeah. That's what they're trying to do is keep everybody in the family. Yeah. And to me, that's what makes this so significant. Yeah, it's not a super exciting car, really. Um, it's a safe move. Uh, they needed yeah. a three-row. And, um, yeah, I think they'll find a lot of customers from their own current pool of customers. Uh, sort of fills a gap in their lineup. Sure. You know, and it's better than a Tribeca. And uh, you know it, it it looks it looks all right. I mean, it looks like a chubby outback, right? right? I can I can dig that. I'm surprised how many people like I get the Tribeca is like obviously this thing's sort of a spiritual successor, <laughs> but like it's like every article I'm reading on the ascent, people are just like there's like the like it's like Mad Libs. It's just like four paragraphs in sucker punch the B9 Tribeca. Yeah. And it's just like, I, all right, yeah, that thing was not great. There were but things I liked about it. I remember that, like, Star Wars Enterprise, like, exactly, like yeah. Council. I mean, yeah, it was not great. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. But, yeah, you're right, it wasn't great. <laughs> I digress. I liked it more than I think a lot of other people did. But yeah. I wasn't in love with it, it. The timing wasn't quite right. The SUV craze wasn't full bloom at that point. Right. And, like, when they killed it, gas prices were so high. Yeah. You know, Subaru was probably smart to get rid of it. I, frankly, I'm surprised they didn't call this thing the Tribeca. But Ascent is just a better name. I yeah, think. I think going away from the Tribeca nameplate is a good idea. There's yeah. a lot of sort of negative opinions out there connected to that name. 
Yeah. So this is going to compete against probably the Volkswagen Atlas. You know, when you look at vehicles that it's probably truly going to be cross-shopped against. I mean, naturally, you've got the Durango, the Grand Cherokee, the Explorer, you know, lots of, you know, everything from Honda, from Chevy, Toyota. But to me, the, the Atlas is kind of this thing's like natural rival. Mm -hmm. They're coming at about the same time. They're like essentially, you know, either new, like reborn or first ever three rows for these companies. Yeah. It's, you know, I think that's what really they're going after that same customer. And it's basically, yeah, going to come down to, you know, personal styling preferences, I think. Um, I personally, you know, I get inside a Subaru and I generally like the way it, it feels. I like mm -hmm. where things are and, and the way, you know, the steering response, it all feels familiar to me. Um, and then there's some people who, who just, you know, prefer Volkswagens. It's like the, the grown up. Uh, WRX driver or the grown-up GTI driver, right. which, which one are they going to pick, you know? I think what you're going to see is a lot of sort of, if you're in the Subaru or the Volkswagen family, you're going to stick with it. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it, it'll be interesting, though. I think they could potentially poach some of the, you know, the other, you know, like Toyota and Honda people who are like, well, what's this? These two things are different. Maybe I'll take a look at mm -hmm. it. But, you know, until we really drive both these vehicles, and we did, we have driven the Atlas. I've driven the Atlas. But... You know, I, I think the trick is going to be these have to be demonstrably better to yeah. get you out of, you know, your Toyota or your Ford yeah, or something. They're, they're, so. they're up against some solid vehicles, for sure. So, but moving along, more new crossovers. Really, S LA was just a total SUV show. It was like we had some pretty cool fast cars and some luxury things, of course, the Wrangler. But just like, it was just like SUV, crossover, SUV, so many just different sizes, shapes, all forms, and that brings us to the Nissan Kicks. Yep, and yeah, the LA show is a sign of the times, and the Nissan Kicks is, you know, another a uh, aspect of that. Um, compact crossovers are, are becoming mm -hmm. more and more common, and um, this one replaces the Juke, which uh, I don't know how I feel about it, but anyway, it's going to start at less than $19,000, well under, um, says Nissan, uh, it'll have a 1.6 liter uh, naturally aspirated four-cylinder engine, making 125 horsepower and 115 pound-feet of torque, uh, going through a CVT to the front wheels only. Um, mm. That means it's not going to be probably as much fun to drive, right. but it, it's going to get uh, a lot better uh, fuel economy. Nissan's expecting 33 miles per gallon combined, which is pretty solid. Yeah, that is. Uh, I think that'll be a big draw. That and the price will be a big draw for it. It's uh, it's probably a more practical vehicle than the Juke. The Juke ended up essentially being like an enthusiast car. Mm -hmm. I think you know yeah. you could get some of them like the Nismo. There was manual transmissions. The the design was just so polarizing. Yeah, it had but sort of a cult following. It did, and I think that's cool. And it's one of those things where people like in our business, like a lot of cars are pretty similar and almost all cars are pretty good so when there's something different that stands out well hey the juke is this thing over there that's pretty cool it's different we like it it's different than the other things we drive it's not vanilla but the problem right. is is they weren't doing that great on the sales charts yeah uh joe blow american public is definitely gonna like the kicks a lot more i think yeah this is definitely more mainstream at least in its looks and sure. i think it's attractive i i, I do too. i like the way it looks i liked the way the juke looked too even though it was weird but i kind of love weird ugly cars with big bug eyes yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah i think this one's nice looking it's got a bunch of uh vibrant colors and uh two-tone options so there's a little bit of uh funk to it yet but yeah i think it sort of uh fills that sort of space of an affordable small crossover it's like the crossover equivalent of the versa yeah that makes sense and i mean you know to your point it looks good it's pretty fuel efficient i mean the name is good the nissan juke kind of sounds like junk i remember some <laughs> jokes um just kicks just is better it reminds it's like, me of cereal right reminds me of my childhood that was what that orange kind of <laughs> Yeah, uh, fruity yeah. cereal. It's yep. pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> it just it sounds better. It's like it sounds more like young singles, just married, maybe one kid. Nissan Kicks. There you go. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah. I just I really think this is going to do a lot more for them than the Juke ever did. And I, this is a guy who kind of liked the Juke. Yeah. You know, I don't think I liked it quite as much as you did or do. 
Uh, if you want a real hot take on the juke, check out Joel Stocksdale's piece on Autoblog. Went up this morning. He is not a fan of the kicks. It was up to him. He would punt the kicks right on down the road. Yep. But uh, that's good. People are talking about these things. Yeah, I'm going to reserve my judgment until I actually drive it. I could maybe see myself that the CBT gives me a little bit of pause, but I could see myself maybe trying to have some fun ringing out the most of this little engine. Yeah. Uh, depends on the driving dynamics, but we'll see. So it's pretty significant. We both generally like it. Right now, we're just, it's kind of that wait and see thing. Yep. I mean, it's a little hard to have that severe of an opinion about a car, unless you're Joel, um, <laughs> this early in the process. Yeah. But that's great. So, moving along, uh, another new vehicle, another new name, the Lincoln Nautilus is a thing now. Yeah. Replaces the MKX. Uh, pretty good looking vehicle. It's uh, basically, you know, it signals a lot of new things for Lincoln that they're not going to do the MK naming nomenclature anymore which I think is great. Yeah. I don't think that ever really caught on. People didn't know what it was. Lincoln is a great brand with a lot of history. So I think they have so many good names they could roll out. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of names like Nautilus, which I don't believe they've ever used, mm -hmm. that does sound good with Lincoln. So to me, yeah. this is an advantage they have over like Lexus and Infiniti and a lot of other brands where you know, people mix up those cars. Right. So it's a new name, uh, lots of new stuff going on with this vehicle. It's a pretty significantly redesigned MKX, new styling, that grill looks pretty good. Yeah. Three different engines, 2.7 liter, um, lots of good stuff going on. Yeah, I think, I'm not sure if there's three or two, but there's... Three, a, you're right, you're right. That, well, I know there's a, a two liter turbo, okay. um, and then there's a 2.7 twin turbo V6. Okay. Um, they're both connected to an eight speed automatic. I'm not sure if there's another one. Okay. Um, uh, I have to go back and look. Right. But anyway, uh, all-wheel drive uh, with all-wheel drive disconnect, a um, mm -hmm. bunch of safety features, adaptive cruise control, lane centering, pre-collision braking, um, and yeah, I mean it. It Lincoln said that the the nomenclature, the MK whatever nomenclature, was confusing for their customers in China, where they have a growing base. Um, right. But yeah, I think it's confusing here too. So I, I, I like that they're moving more toward real names. Yeah, it's, I mean, just the, or excuse me, the Nautilus um, looks pretty good. Specs seem to grade out pretty well, no matter how many engines it mm -hmm. might offer. It uh, it looks pretty good. It Interior looks, looks solid. Yeah. yeah. And this is, the MKX was their best selling vehicle because that's the like bullseye part of the market. Right. This is what people are buying. So they really have to get this right. Um, a lot of good names coming out of the LA show, like we said, the Kicks, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the Hyundai Kona, the Subaru Ascent, mm -hmm. um, and I think Nautilus is one of them. I think this is actually the, I would say, the most daring play uh, because Nautilus could sound a little bit like nauseous. It doesn't exactly <laughs> roll off the tongue all that well, but it's it's also a cool word. Is like we're word guys. Yeah, I think it looks great on paper. Um, and it it. it and it evokes a sense of travel, Nautilus. Yes. It makes you think of like seafaring and stuff. And then they've got the Navigator. You know, it's a, it's a common theme, I think. Yeah, I think I think that they're going to pull it off. And I, I mean, it's better than the MKX. Ironically, I thought the MKX was really the only MK name that actually <laughs> worked because like X crossover, X. Mm -hmm. It's kind of you know that was like to me the only one that made sense. Yeah, MKS. MKT, no, thank you. Yeah, MKT like never to, got it. Right. MKC maybe was the second least worst. I don't know. <laughs> but in, to be fair, we're not ragging on Lincoln. Like, I mix up the Lexuses all the time. Yep. I know the RX because it's their best selling vehicle, basically. But like, NX, GX, like, come on, guys. It gets confusing. And same with Infinity and even the Cadillac, you know. Yeah. I think they're going to see this like. You know, XT and CT nomenclature may, might not be as strong a play as they think it is. Yeah. In some ways, I think they might have been on the right track going, you know, back towards names or even just like the CTS things. But I digress. <laughs> uh, sticking with Lincoln, uh, this is, uh, it's going to be on sale soon. It's, you know, Critical View is just an icon. And now they've got the Nautilus. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they've got to come up with, you know, eventually the MKC replacement, uh, MKT sort of you know, basically that's like a fleet livery thing anyway. But I feel like they're in okay shape. They just need to kind of, I think, change the perception a little bit more. And what they need to do is kind of cut through the clutter. Yeah. Because right now in this age of autonomous cars, Tesla this, you know, company Faraday Future, 
XYZ other company you've never heard of. Like, that's what's in the news right now. Then maybe GM or Ford kind of are over here and Volkswagen does something. The Lincoln brand is just like, even though their products are pretty solid, like so far, like in this like quiet place mm -hmm. that, I don't know, I think they need to do something to really shake things up. Yeah. I don't know what that is, <laughs> but um, this is solid product. Base hit up the middle, it'll yeah. do what it needs to do. But I think they need some other sort of like moonshot to get people really talking about the rest of the brand. Well, we'll be paying attention to that for sure. Yeah, so we'll see for the you know the Lincoln mid-engine supercar. I don't know whatever that is. <laughs> but speaking of you know kind of random things, concept um, also in LA, big deal. The FTAC concept. It's uh, pretty wild looking. Yeah. It's kind of it's basically a design study. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, they didn't give a lot of details about it. Um, it stands for Future Toyota Adventure Concept. Um, it's got all-wheel drive, a torque vectoring, a uh, terrain response. It's got a roof rack, a bike rack. Um, and yeah, the biggest thing is the styling. It's got that, it's got a lot going on in the mm -hmm. front end. And then uh, I think the rear is pretty stylish. The front end yeah. is a little off-putting. Um, but yeah, it looks a lot better from behind. It's the second straight like North American auto show where Toyota has rolled out like a random concept. Yeah. They had that uh, other kind of quirky thing in New York yeah. that was like, it had like, what did it have, like North Face or something, like tents inside of it. It was just all this random stuff, mm -hmm. and it was meant to like spur conversation. And I think that's what this this is doing, only it's um, it's obviously more realistic than that Nor uh, New York concept. And to me, I kind of look at this and think maybe this is what the Forerunner ultimately evolves into in like five to ten years. Um, yeah, I think this, I don't know. It looks pretty good. This could be a preview for uh, future cars. Um, I expect they will tone down some of the styling, uh, especially oh, sure. in, especially up front. But uh, yeah, they didn't really say much more about it. Um, but we'll see what comes of it. Yeah. Uh, Definitely one of the I wouldn't call this one of the crazy runaway highlights of the show. But as we're just kind of whipping through the like some of the other significant reveals, it's something you're gonna you know head to our site, check out the videos, check out the pictures, uh, you know, look at it up close. You know, get onto you know our social platforms, tweet at us, let us know what you think about things like this concept. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, there weren't a lot of concepts at this. Yes, either, that's so. what I like about Toyota is like people sometimes ding them for being this like conservative button down brand. Like I said, this is two straight North American auto shows where, boom, they've got arguably one of the weirdest concepts yeah. there. So good for them. Yeah. Uh, other thing that I think we'd be remiss about if we left out is the i8 Roadster. It's about time is yeah. my initial thought there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's no surprise. Uh, it's a surprise that it took this long, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's finally here. Uh, it's got it's, that and the coupe both have some improvements. Um, Ranges up uh, from 15 miles to 18 miles of electric range. Um, wow, that's yeah. big. Yeah, <laughs> they could have done a little better, but I don't know. You don't want to put too much weight in right. the batteries. Right. Um, it's got uh, the Roadster has a top that closes in 16 seconds. Uh, the aluminum pieces that hold the top to the car are 3D printed. Um, I know BMW's uh, iVentures uh, has been investing in companies like dig, uh, 3D printing and, and stuff like that. So this, this might be part of that collaboration. Um, let's see. Uh, the Roadster weighs 132 pounds more mm. than the Coupe at 3513. Um, and it can uh, stay in EV mode up to 65 miles per hour. That's uh, pretty cool, actually. Yeah. It's, uh, and it does 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds. Um, the Coupe does it in 4.2. It's a little faster than before. Um, it's up uh, 12 horsepower to 141. And uh, BMW says they That's just for the electric part, right? 141, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Then, yeah, because the, the three-pot uh, gas engine is uh, 228 horsepower. Gotcha, yeah. Um, and it's turbocharged. Sure. Uh, they said they've made that uh, more efficient, uh, less emissions, and better sounding, so. Cool. So, I mean, basically, short answer, it's a Spider, Roadster, Convertible, whatever you want to call it, I8. Yep. Pretty cool looking. It's uh, coming soon to the professional athlete slash rock star <laughs> yeah. in your local city. Um, this spring. This spring, mm -hmm. yeah. I think LA is a great place to reveal something like this because yeah. it's, 
it's you know it's a starry you know sort of Hollywood car. It's an eye-catching car for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But again, I don't know what took them so long because yeah. the regular car has been out for quite a while. Yeah. But and they've been have they've had open top concepts for a really long time of this, yeah. of this vehicle. So it's good to finally see it come to production. Cool. Definitely. Now, in other news, a lot of just like little nuggets, things that kind of came out of the L.A. Auto Show, uh, things that happened at the show, were said at the show, were said around the show, or just this week. <laughs> it was kind of a, like a newsy week, which is good. Good yeah. for us. <laughs> uh, let's check this out here. We got a Jaguar Nürburgring time. The XE, souped up XE, runs a 721. It's yeah, pretty fast. It's the XE SV Project 8, and that time was 721 makes it the fastest production sedan around the Nürburgring. Um, the STI that did less than seven minutes um, was, uh, you know, built for the track. Right. So that rules it out. Um, this Project 8, uh, they're going to sell 300 of them worldwide. Cool. So it's pretty rare. Um, so I like the XE. Yeah, it's cool. I do too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, a hot one is, is I love I love hot sedans. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to cost $188,495. It's a lot for an XE, <laughs> yeah. which bases around 30 or so, they say. Right. And wow. uh, this video of the Nürburgring that you see behind us, that's uh, you can go watch that on our on our website. It's pretty sweet. Check it out. That is the uh, another really quick time put down at the Nürburgring. Yeah. I think we're getting a little skeptical about some of these, but, I mean, hey, there's the video. They did it. They beat out the <laughs> uh, an Alfa Romeo uh, Giulia. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, check out that video. It's pretty cool. Uh, in other news, Kia rolled out the uh, the Nero plug-in hybrid. Uh, they literally just showed this. Uh, press conference was like less than an hour ago. Yeah. So check that out. We got the full rundown on the site. Essentially what this is is the plug-in version of the Nero hybrid. Mm -hmm. Nothing too um, overwhelming there, but uh, 105 MPGE and 26 miles of just pure EV driving range. So... You know, again, I think Kia is just trying to get ahead of the curve here where, like, hybrids, plug-in hybrids are just one of the things you might want to consider when you're buying a car. Yeah, I think more uh, affordable plug-in hybrid or plug-in options in general there are, the better. Yeah, um, as a green car editor yeah. probably would. <laughs> yeah, I think the more that they're, they're on the market, it's going to cause more competition mm -hmm. and, and have everyone step up their game. But, totally. yeah, this one will be available by year's end. Good looking vehicle. I think it's uh yeah, smart move for Kia. I like I'm really impressed with Kia on how they're just saying, like, look, we're not the biggest hybrid guys or the electric guys. Other people probably have more money, but we're just gonna use this technology and we're gonna put it in all different parts of our portfolio where mm -hmm. we think consumers might want it. Like, yeah, you know, the I eight is an electric car in a hybrid. It, it costs as much as a lot of people's houses. Yeah. This you can buy. Yeah. So props to Kia for doing it. I, yeah, they make a lot of cars that you know contain a lot of nice content, um, and they're relatively affordable. Sure. And that's sort of their thing, and they do it well. Speaking of other things uh, that are probably will be a little less affordable is the ID Cross confirmed for 2020. They tell us it'll be affordable. Uh, they, I'm not exactly sure I'm, what affordable means. Yeah, a little cynical on <laughs> what affordable means on that, but but yeah, the, but I hope it is. It's confirmed. VW uh, ID Cross is coming in 2020. It's um, about the size and shape of a, of a Tiguan. Well, mm -hmm. not the shape. It's more of a four-door coupe, sort of. Right. A coupe over. Looks good. Um, yeah, I think it's attractive. Yeah. Um, I don't think they need to do much to it to, to change it for production. No, I hope they don't. I think right. it, it almost looks like Tesla like. Uh, you could argue maybe Tesla yeah. looks like Volkswagen. I don't know. It's but, got a little um, bit of that silhouette, yeah. Sure. Um, and it's going to be the first of their new EVs coming to the U.S., followed by the ID Buzz mm. in 2022. So that'll be cool. That'll I'm, be awesome. I'm really looking forward to that one. I think a lot of people are. Absolutely. I was at, uh, I think it was Pebble Beach where they confirmed that. Really cool yeah. move for, uh, for Volkswagen. I think what you're seeing right now is they've just, they are just, they're relentlessly trying to change the message about them as like, diesel car company mm -hmm. and what they're saying now is like every car show you go to it's like here's our other electric crossover or here's our thing we talked about a couple years ago that we're now confirming and hey it's electric so it's a smart move yeah. i really think you know vehicles like this are gonna excite american consumers and people are gonna want to buy these things yeah i think i think volkswagen's starting to put dieselgate behind them maybe yes. a little bit finally um they're expected to have record sales mm -hmm. this year so 
hopefully uh, this is a sign of good things to come. Yeah, big news for Volkswagen. Uh, another cool thing we got to talk about is the Mercedes-Benz CLS. Uh, they got an inline six in this thing, which mm -hmm. I think is yeah. great. And most of all, it's drop dead gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a crazy departure from what came before it, but uh, yeah, it's definitely attractive. Um, the straight six, uh, three liter turbo, uh, it's got a 48 volt mild hybrid system in it. So stop, start and all that. Um, 362 horsepower, 369 pound feet of torque, uh, made into a nine, nine speed automatic transmission. Mm -hmm. Um, they didn't give a lot of other figures. They, they said it's 130 mile per hour top speed. They didn't give zero to 60 or fuel economy, but, but yeah, it's a CLS. I yeah. mean, it's, it's going to be pretty quick for a big car. It looks pretty good. I'm, I'm really impressed with like what Mercedes is doing with their like sort of evolving design language. Mm -hmm. They're, I think they're toning down some of that. Like, you know, if you looked at the, you know, their, their smaller vehicles were just so swoopy and curvy. And now it's like, they're just kind of making these lines sort of refined, they're tapered. It's, I'd say a little more angular, but also, you know, there's still some, you know, sort of curves in there too, so. And their interiors have always been sort of, I don't know, stodgy, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, this one, it looks really nice inside too. And it's, uh, it's got that dual uh, digital display available. Yeah. That's in the S class that we have uh, in the office right now. Um, so yeah, in, and it's got these, uh, the energizing comfort system nice. which uh, you know you put on a mode and it sort of sets the mood for you with lighting and and uh temperature and sound um that is that's, and, and a massage of course that's i mean <laughs> so i just we've both driven our s-class a little bit of a tangent here yeah that is it no car knows how to set the mood quite yeah. like an s-class yeah. you know i had like the the, the scent was going whatever yeah. that is the air was uh purified or whatever they call mm -hmm. it uh, I was getting like a hot stone massage. It was a pretty great commute. I don't know yeah. if I've walked into work feeling that refreshed in a while. It's so relaxing, for sure. Mercedes S-Class CLS right down the line. You can get some pretty great, great options of these things that really make your ride comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got to wrap things up here with some Corvette ZR1 pricing. Uh, let's see. They unveiled this at the Los Angeles show in convertible form. Uh, the coupe, which we saw, uh, re saw it in Dubai a couple weeks ago, $119,995. And then for the convertible, it's $4,000 more. So, and it's 60 pounds heavier. 60 pounds heavier. Okay, <laughs> makes sense. Um, that's the pricing. It's the, with the aero package, it does uh, 1,000 pounds of downforce. <sighs> Would not want to be run over by that. That is wicked. <laughs> that is, that's just awesome. Yeah, it's cool. So uh, yeah, that was uh, it was exciting to see that, um, and to know how much you have to spend to pay for it. I'm going to start saving up. There you go. It's it's always fun when they just kind of roll out those pricing. And if you know you're in the market for a you know a Corvette, you got 123 bills you want to drop, uh, throw the Corvette into our car finder. It can help you determine if the Corvette or perhaps I guess I don't know a Lamborghini Aventador or you know, a, a souped up Ferrari or something would be the competitive set. Uh, but use our car finder, check things out. And uh, yeah, that is basically the LA Auto Show. I yeah, think, uh, that that's... pretty much wraps it up. I mean, there's more on our website. Uh, you'll definitely want to go check out Nissan's Star Wars vehicles. Those are pretty cool. Pretty sweet. A lot of cool videos weeks, yeah. on basically everything at the show. Mm -hmm. uh, be sure to hit us up on Twitter, tweet at us. Leave stuff, uh, please leave comments on the articles that we put up, uh, you know, to support our articles on Facebook. Uh, leave us comments. Let us know what you think. We want to hear from you. Uh, it's been a good show. It's yeah. been fun. Yeah. Uh, John Snyder, I'm Greg Migliori. And don't forget to check back soon. We're going to have our editor's picks. Editor's our picks. Favorite Almost forgot cars. those. Yep. And so, yeah, we'll have those soon. And make sure to let us know what you think are your favorites or that you think uh, we should have chosen for ours i'm sure you'll have some different opinions than some of our editors well said john <laughs> couldn't have said it better myself uh thanks for watching i uh, hope you enjoyed the la auto show i know we sure did mm -hmm. um we'll see you later we'll see you at ces in detroit
everybody, I'm Joel Stocksdale for Autoblog. We're here at the LA Auto Show with the brand new 2018 Mazda 6. It's a heavily refreshed version of the old car. You might not notice it at first because the outside is a fairly mild refresh. The biggest changes are up front where the front bumper has been cleaned up a little bit, a little uh, crisper lines, it's got this uh, concave grille with a little more depth, new headlights. Um, one of the uh, one of the bigger changes is on the inside. The interior has been revamped. This is the new signature trim level, which has a particularly luxurious interior. It has Napa leather, it has real wood trim. It also has ultra suede on the dashboard. Um, it's a fairly premium place to be. One of the other big updates to this is under the hood. It has a new fuel. Um, it will run on regular fuel, 87 octane, and in that case, it'll make 227 horsepower.
There he is. So, uh, imagine being in a shopping cart, uh, but it's only got two wheels and you're going about 12 miles an hour. My ass hurts. <laughs> I was looking three feet in front of me because every, every minute, like, seam or rock or whatever was, like, getting kicked in the ass. So, let's never, ever do this again. Hey Auto Bloggers, welcome to another episode of Car Hacks. If you have kids, you know they love tracking dirt absolutely everywhere. And it's never fun for when it's time for you to clean your car's interior. Luckily, a lot of kids also love Play-Doh. And we found this hack that claims this popular toy will clean dirt from your seats. Let's try it out. The idea is that the sticky texture of Play-Doh will pick up dirt regardless of what surface it may be on. Originally, Play-Doh was used as a wallpaper cleaner in the 1930s. Once you identified the location with the dirt, grab some Play-Doh and mix it around for a few seconds to soften it and awaken your inner child. Once that's done, flatten it out and dab it on the dirty area. And the verdict is, dirty, more like dirt free. Hacks are fun to try, but for tips on how to professionally care for your vehicle, check out Autoblog Details featuring Larry Casella. For more car hacks, be sure to subscribe, don't forget to like, and share this video. I'm Amr, safe travel.
Hey auto bloggers, welcome to another episode of Car Hacks. Stick on hooks are great for holding up items like kitchen utensils and your family photos, but will they hold up grocery bags in your car? Let's test it out. The idea is that the stick on hooks will eliminate the rolling of grocery bags in your back seat and give you more room to place more items. For this hack, I'm using a three pound limit hooks. First, clean the area and place the stick on hooks on a flat surface near the ground. Make sure you don't place the hooks on any surface that heats up or the hooks will fall. Now let's load it up with a couple of grocery bags and go for a ride. Two out of three isn't bad, but it still failed. Hacks are fun to try, but for tips on how to professionally care for your vehicle, check out Autoblog Details featuring Larry Casella. For more car hacks, be sure to subscribe, and don't forget to like and share this video. I'm Amr, safe travels. This is the all-new Lincoln Navigator, and it stands out for three main reasons. The first is that it has the same 450 horsepower engine as the Ford Raptor. That's as cool as it sounds. The other two reasons have to do with the interior. The first is just, this is beautiful. It looks fantastic. From a design perspective, 
Just really love how this tiered dash here really removes some of the visual bulk that you get when you're driving a great big truck, which is really what this is. Yes, some people complain that this great big screen here looks like it's just a iPad stacked to the dash, but really it does remove uh, just how big this would be if it just all came out at you, while still allowing you to very easily reach and see all the controls on here. Again, big, simple controls that you get here with the SYNC 3 system. Now this is the black label. Now what that uh, includes is a choice of three special environments. This one is called Yacht Club. It has this very cool blue color. It's very 60s, but in a very good way. And besides the special blue color, you do have leather on the dash as opposed to vinyl. And the seats have a higher quality leather as well. It has this beautiful soft leather to it. And each of the different environments, the different colors, have actually a different stitching pattern on the seats. And then there's just some great details in here. All of the black labels have the very tasteful Lincoln logo in the corner in its uh, distinctive uh, wood trim. This has this beautiful white wood trim in it. And as I pull back here, you can see that that stitching goes all the way around here onto this side. This is an all digital screen right here. And then you have these fantastic 30 way power seats. Now you can get these in a Continental, but frankly, I think they match this car far better. Andrew Bottom. And the other nice thing about all of the navigators, not just the black label, is that there's just not a lot of Ford parts bin stuff. I mean, yes, that is the trailer brake controller from an F-150, but that's pretty much it. Turn signals, these seat controllers, uh, this great electronic shifter. Other Lincolns just have them as kind of plasticky buttons, roughly about there, but this, these look nice. They're not contrived, they're easy to reach, easy to use. No problem whatsoever with those. Also, you'll note with the center console, not connected to the dash. Again, this is to kind of break up the visual bulk of the cabin. And also, it does hide that you do have this nice great big bin down here. You can put a purse if you'd like while still keeping lots of space open for, that's a wireless charging area there. It's also where two USB ports, there are USB ports in every single row of this car, including the third row. You have great big cup holders there and a nice place to put your smartphone. And then underneath here, great big bin, as well as the CD player. So sure, this is the black label. It costs nearly $100,000, but you don't have to spend that much. Lesser trim levels, sure, you don't get the fun colors, you don't have real leather on the dash, but it's still a special interior. The other way the Navigator stands out is just how much room is here in the third row seat. Now that might seem obvious in such a large vehicle, but really most truck-based SUVs, not so much. I'm six foot three. I'm perfectly comfortable back here. And the other thing is you have nice power reclining third row seats. I would not be anywhere near as comfortable in a Cadillac Escalade. Heck, I don't think I'd fit back there at all. That makes a huge difference. And it's a big reason why this for most people is really a better choice.
Hey auto bloggers, welcome to another episode of Car Hacks. Backseat entertainment is a must when you have young children. So we found this DIY tablet holder hack to help keep the kids occupied on long car rides. Let's try it out. The idea is that the cubicle hooks will work as an alternative tablet holder in your car. For this hack to work, your seats need to be fabric. First, place one hook on the bottom. Then use your tablet as a guide for where to place the other hooks. Now slide your tablet in and turn on your kid's favorite show. So far it works, but is it safe while driving? On the streets, the tablet remained in place, but what about hard turns? The hack worked! Hacks are fun to try, but for tips on how to professionally care for your vehicle, check out Autoblog Details featuring Larry Casella. For more car hacks, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to like and share this video. I'm Amr, safe travel.
Hi everybody, Reese Counts from Autoblog here. Today we are at US 131 Motorsports Park in Western Michigan to drive that, the 808 or 840 horsepower Dodge Challenger SRT Demon. Now Dodge has a long and storied history of building performance cars, and while competitors like the Ford Mustang and Chevy Camaro have moved more into the sports car territory, Dodge has stayed true to that drag racing muscle car route. Now, we're really excited to be here. I've been looking forward to driving this for a long time. So let's go get some runs in on the drag strip. After that first run, all I could do was giggle and laugh. Like It was one of the best experiences of my life, uh, even though it was a matter of, I don't know, 15 seconds for the whole thing. Nothing I've ever done has uh, excited me quite like this. Launching the demon's quite a precise thing, so after the first run, all I wanted to do was try it again. I've driven a lot of really fast cars. Um, nothing I've ever driven accelerates off the line like this. I've driven a Tesla, which is just as quick, but the noise of the supercharger, the exhaust, the way the tires squeal, there's nothing else I've ever driven that's quite like this. So while the Demon may have been designed for the drag strip, it's likely to spend most of its time on the streets. For the most part, that's a pretty good thing. It's comfortable, it's smooth, and it really doesn't drive all that much different than a standard Hellcat. It feels a little wider and there's obviously a lot more grip with these drag radials on here, but it's really not that hard to drive. So the 6.2 liter supercharged Hemi V8 and the Demon is based on the one that's in the standard Hellcat but more than 50% of the parts are new. One of the most significant changes is the supercharger is now 2.7 liters. All of that combined means the Demon makes 808 horsepower on pump gas, and if you run race fuel, power jumps to 840 horsepower and 770 pound-feet of torque. Like the Hellcat, the Demon uses an eight-speed automatic transmission. Unlike the Hellcat, there's no option for a manual. On a drag strip, this car in particular, you're better off just putting it in drive and letting it shift for itself. The first few gears are relatively short and when you're really laying on it, come quickly. That said, the top few are pretty long. I'm cruising along at 70-ish and I'm not even hitting two grand. Still, fuel economy is pretty abysmal in this thing. Cruising around on these back roads, the engine kind of settles down. It's got this eight-speed transmission, so the top few gears are pretty long. I'm revving at just under 1,500 RPM at about 55 miles an hour. There is a little bit of supercharger whine in the background, but I'm not going to complain about that. Once you do dip into it, though, it really moves. So the Demon's bodywork is significantly wider than that on the standard Hellcat, and that's mostly to fit these massive Nitto drag radials on there. These were specially designed for the Demon, and if you look at the sidewall, there's a little Demon logo. They're just barely allowed for road use. There's two little grooves that dissipate some amount of rain, but really you don't want to take these on anywhere but a track. Aside from the wide body, the interior and the exterior don't differ that much from the standard Hellcat. Sure, all the Hellcat badge are dollar, but from the factory, as it sits, the Demon only has one seat. Could you drive the Demon every day? I'd say so, with one caveat. Swap out these Nitto drag radials for the tires, say, off the Hellcat widebody. These
<laughs> oh, I love this car.
So here was the plan. I was going to fly from Detroit to Seattle, where I would meet up with senior editor Alex Kirstein, and from there we'd drive his 1998 Toyota Tacoma and a brand new TRD Pro all the way to Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada, traveling along as many forestry trails as possible and doing our best not to get lost. But there's one problem, a big one. Okay, so it's two days before we're supposed to leave on this trip, and I come out, and there's a couple little drips of gear oil coming out of the differential. We tore it apart, and we figured out that it's that little seal in there that I showed you earlier. And that little seal uh, went bad. I'm not really sure why, but of course, you know, timing's everything. When does the seal go bad? <laughs> right before you're about to take a long trip. So the most important thing is this diff seal. Uh, so that is where the front axle goes into differential, like I mentioned last night. Mm -hmm. It was leaking, not much, but I just got nervous because I don't know how much is leaking out when I'm moving, like I know how much is coming out when I'm sitting. I'm, I'm making this seem like it's a much more precision job than it is. I think a lot of people just pound this in and it's fine, but I've also heard a lot of these seals leaking when people don't put them in exactly to the right depth. So then the second part of that will be, I need to refill the diff. Uh, if I don't refill the differential, that's even worse than having a differential leak because then it definitely explodes. I don't know how I lucked out in finding a truck in the exact spec that I want. It's hard to find a five-speed manual Tacoma just in general. Uh, people like these trucks, they don't sell them very often unless they're really beat up. Are you hearing what this is saying? This is not a quick route to Omac Okanagan Brewster. Your GPS is wrong. Deep mud, ruts, and water over the road ahead. This sounds awesome. What are we looking for? All right, let's do it. All right, so we cranked on it real hard. We're gonna go take it for a drive. Uh, we just put in the new axle seal and we have some coolant in the truck now. So we're just gonna check and make sure nothing's leaking out. Get things warmed up, take it for a drive, make sure nothing's rattling. Just kind of peer under the front of it and see if anything's leaking. Yeah, nothing is. Okay. That's good. All right, we got to drive around for a few minutes and uh, get it warmed up. I'll go rob your house. Sounds good. Does that sound? Okay, let's figure out what that is. This is fun. Yeah, it'd be a little more fun if we weren't lost. We're still on the road according to GPS, so I think this is it. It's just really overgrown. Nearing the Washington state border, our overlanding expedition took a turn for the worse. We decided to head down an overgrown cliffside trail that looked like it hadn't been driven on in a while. A mile ahead, we found out why. The road had been washed away, forcing us to put the trucks in reverse and back out of the brush. It's the, um, remember we put that cotter pin on underneath the dust cap? I, I think that's rubbing on the hub as it's spinning around. We, we all feel pretty confident about this, right? I do. 
Chris? Chris was like, I'm so sick of working on trucks. I'm done. I'm done. Either convince me that I want to do this, or I really don't, and would love to pay someone to do it for me. It's no shame in paying someone to do this. This is a pain in the ass. I mean, this is how I think people get good at doing stuff quickly. You mess up something simple, and then you Redo it. Take it apart and put it back together like 15 times in a row. Yeah. At the end, you're just like, mm -hmm. just whatever that sound was. I don't hear anything goofy. I mean, I'm I'm hypersensitive to every bump. I'm like, is that is that a bump on the road? Is that a shutter in the drive line? I'm gonna be like a nervous parent for a while. After driving over 600 miles, much of it off-road in Washington, and one late-night Canadian border crossing, we made it through British Columbia to Banff National Park in Alberta. With the mountains looming overhead, it was hard to focus on the trucks we were supposed to be filming. When I arrived in Seattle, I was skeptical that this 20-year-old little truck that was in pieces in a garage was even going to make it through the entire trip. Instead, it proved itself to be quite resilient, tackling all of the on- and off-road miles we threw at it. So we got to uh, Washington Highway, State Highway 20, and there was a road closed sign, um, and it was because the highway was like washed out completely. So we couldn't take the highway, so now we're on some more backcountry roads. We're heading north, um, trying to go a little bit quickly because we were anticipating being able to you know, drive on the highway for uh, most of this. We still haven't even made it to Canada yet. We need to get to Kelowna, British Columbia today. So uh, we're kind of cruising along on this uh, backcountry road now, and hopefully we'll get on a, uh, a paved road relatively soon, but also, like, this is a lot more fun than driving on paved roads. So it might be another late night, but I don't know. This is a lot more fun to me. Look at that.
Hey auto bloggers, welcome to another episode of Car Hacks. In this ep episode, we're gonna try removing a window sticker by just using a new newspaper and some hot water. Let's test it out. Here's what you'll need, some old newspapers and a bucket with hot water. The idea is that the wet newspaper and hot temperature will soak up the sticker long enough to loosen up the adhesive for easy removal. Now that the newspaper is wet, we'll place it on the sticker for 15 minutes and see the results. After 15 minutes, the verdict is... Well, at least you had some reading material while you waited. Hacks are fun to try, but for tips on how to professionally care for your vehicle, Check out Autoblog Details featuring Larry Casella. For more car hacks, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to like and share this video. I'm Amr, safe travels.